Thanks be to God. My daughter Grace, a few years ago, I think she was probably second or third grade, somewhere around there, she came home from school one day and she was so excited about what she had learned at school. They had talked about what it means to be a vegetarian at school and she just thought it was just the coolest thing. And at supper that night while we were eating, she said she was telling us excitedly about what she had learned about in school that day. She said, no, Dad, I think I'm going to be a vegetarian. Because it really sounds cool. It sounds like it's a really way, really good way to be healthy. She goes, yeah, I think I want to be a vegetarian. Except for I want to continue to eat steak, chicken, and shrimp. <laughs> You know, many Christians kind of have a similar attitude. Yeah, I, I want to be a Christian. I want Jesus to be my Savior. But I don't know about all that prayer and going to church stuff and uh, really getting involved and doing a whole lot, and especially all that stuff about holiness. Ooh. But I want to be a Christian. I believe. I believe in God. Sometimes I'll be witnessing to someone or sharing my faith with someone and inviting them to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's quite evident that they don't want to have anything to do with really committing to anything. You know, we've got an epidemic, and I call it an epidemic for uh, a good reason, I think, but we have an epidemic of people in our culture today who want to be spiritual but not religious. And there is some sense in that. I understand some of the logic and the sense behind that, but a lot of people want to be spiritual but not religious. And I think a lot of times what that may translate into is I want to be spiritual. I want to have the benefit of being in a relationship with God in the generic sense, whatever, whoever that may be. And usually, probably more than often than not, a lot of times it's in, in the sense of just another form of a, of a self-help program, almost. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, the self-help industry is a billion, billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry. Self-help books and seminars and all sorts of different things. And a lot of times people kind of treat spirituality in the same way. It's just another thing, not all that important, but just another avenue of my life where I may be able to tap into something that can be of help and a benefit to me without really committing to anything serious and especially anything that's hard for me to do. That would be an inconvenience. That's, I think, a lot of times how people try to discern what is God's will for my life. If it's inconvenient, it must not be God's will for my life. Well, tell that to Jesus who prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, somewhat, if there's any way around what You're calling me to. Do you think what Jesus went through was convenient? Was it convenient? Well, Jesus died so that we don't have to, right? Is that right? No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Because Jesus also said this. If we want to be His followers, if we want to be Jesus' followers, what do we have to do? We have to take up our cross. Take up our cross how often? Every other two times a year. Christmas and Easter, right? Daily. Take up your cross. What does that mean? Is that a, is that a, a, a program of convenience? Taking up our cross daily? I mean, it's an instrument of execution. And we're meant to take it that way. How about this? I saw a church sign one time that said this. It said, 
Jesus paid it all, and you get to keep the change. Hallelujah, right? Well, y'all know, I know Terry knows it's him, right? Jesus paid it all, and I get to keep the change? Is that what it said? One person who wrote that hymn knew better than that. Jesus paid it all and what? All to Him I owe. All to Him I owe. Ephesians, we talked about a few weeks ago, says this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, well, which is it? James said, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? And the obvious answer to his question, and especially the way it's worded in the Greek language, he expects the absolute no. Faith alone can't save you. So is James and the Apostle Paul here in conflict with one another? Are they carrying out a theological battle right here within the pages of Scripture? No. James is not saying anything different from what Paul was saying. Because Paul certainly wasn't saying, if we keep reading, we're not saved by works, by earning our salvation, but we're saved for good works. We're saved for good works. For we are what He has made us, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God hath prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So the question this morning is, we're saved by faith. And we're saved by faith alone. We can attest to that, testify to that. We're saved by faith alone. But as Adrian Rogers said, Adrian Rogers was a, a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention and a, a great preacher in the Southern Baptist Church. And he still has a program, even though he's, he's been passed away for several years now, called Love Worth Finding. And he said this. He said, You're, you, you can't be saved by good works we're not saved by good works. But you can't be saved without good works. Now I know it's getting a little, maybe a little confusing, but bear with me. Bear with me. The question is, what kind of faith is a saving faith? And the answer to that question is the faith that saves is a faith that works. A faith that works. A faith that will be evident in good works. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. When, we, when you're reading James, there's a lot of echoes to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. He said this, Not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Emphasis here on the word say. Not all those who say unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do, who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 28, what do you think? A man had two sons. And the first he asked to go out into the vineyard and work. And he said, no, I don't think so. But later he changed his mind and he went. And the man went to his second son and said, son, go out into the vineyard and work. And he said, sure, no problem, Dad. I'm right there. I'll be right there. And he never went. Jesus then asked the question, who did the will of his father? The first or the second? The one who said he would and didn't? Or the one who said, no, I don't think so, but went ahead and did later? Changed his mind and went. I think the obvious answer there again is the second, right? The second. So what is the faith that saves? James says this in chapter 1, verse 22. He says, 
Be ye doers of the word and not merely hearers only who deceive themselves. I went to uh, you Carolina fans just ignore all this stuff about Duke here. Bear with me. I was so excited about going to a Duke basketball game last year. Last year was it was uh, uh, well it was this year early in this year during the ACC season. And I had my ticket card and I got my ID and I thought I stuck it in my pocket because I needed my ticket card and I needed my ID to get in. But when I got down there to Cameron Indoor Stadium and started to get out of the car, I went to double check to make sure I had what I needed. I had my ticket card, but I did not have my ID. So I thought, man, this is about almost a 40 minute drive back home, but I had time. I had time, and I, I called Christy, and I said, Christy, I, I can't find my ID. And she said, well, let me look around. And she looked by my dresser, and she found my ID laying in the floor. And I thought, well, I've got time to go back and get it, but it'll be pushing it. So let me just go, do I went to go double check with this uh, lady that I knew who was a head usher. She was a head usher so you could get into big basketball. And I, her name was MJ. I went to MJ and I said, MJ, I, I, I forgot my ID, but I do have my card. And she knew me. And she goes, oh, don't worry about it. They're going to let you in. Don't worry about it. So I called Christy back and said, don't worry, I'm not coming home. Uh, MJ said, I'll be okay. So when it came time, and I stood there in line, you know, us Cameron crazies, we stand in line a long time for stuff. Camp out and all kinds of crazy stuff. So here I am standing in line this whole time when I had plenty of time to go back home. And when I got up to the door to get in, I gave them my car, swiped my car, and walked right on in. I was like, cool, I made it. But then as I was actually getting ready to walk into the arena, into the gym, there was a security guy there. And I showed him my yellow ticket card. He says, but where's your ID? Hold on just a second. Where's your ID? And I said, well, I've got my ID, but I left it at home. Can I get in? He said, no, I'm sorry. I can't let you in. I said, but, 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 please. I'm sorry. you got to have your ID to get back in. And now it was too late. It was too late. I couldn't go back home. Now, I'm not comparing Cameron Indoor Stadium to going to heaven, okay? But you see the point. Just because somebody said, oh, don't worry about it, no big deal, it'll be okay. I needed to really have my stuff in order. Jesus says, not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And then I will declare them, I never knew you. Go away from me. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, Jesus says, will be like the wise man who built his house on a rock. 